The next thing is that every single day of Ramadan, make sure that you engage in some form of tadabbur, some form of learning, some form of reflecting over the verses of Allah, you know, connecting with the sacred knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with through His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning every single day, learn something new. And this could be in the form of reading something, or it could be in the form of listening to a lecture. And depending on your situation, like for example, if you're still commuting to work, if you have to take your children to school in the morning, you do the morning drive, or even if you are walking your children to school. You know, for example, if you have your phone with you, and if you've subscribed to a podcast, for example, on the way back, you know, you can listen to something as you're walking, as you're driving. And if that is not something you do, you are at home, then again, fix a time that 10 minutes, you know, you spend in reading something, learning something. Because when you learn, when you increase in your knowledge, your mind is more active. You are more aware. You are more conscious. And as you are more conscious, more aware, you do the things that you typically do with more intention. And you do it more intentionally. You do it in a state that you are more mindful in a state that you are more eager to earn the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So make sure that you learn something new every single day. It doesn't have to be a three hour long lecture. Some people, mashallah, they're very fortunate. They have enrolled in certain courses. And alhamdulillah, there are many courses that are available online this month of Ramadan for you to benefit from. If you're able to do that, excellent. And if you are not in that position, you have school, you have have work, then still make sure that you learn something new every single day. And it could be in the form of just spending five minutes, 10 minutes, but see what your situation allows, but make sure you do this. In the Quran, we learn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa khtilaf al layli wal nahari la ayat al li'uli al albab. That indeed in the creation of the skies and the earth, and in the alternation of the night and the day are surely signs for people who have understanding. Meaning they learn from these things. They pay attention to these things. They're not so busy that they can't even take a moment to think about how beautiful the sky looks. They are who? الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ there are those people who remember Allah while they're standing, while they're sitting, and also while laying on their sides. And they remember Allah in that state. Now think about it. You may have to stand maybe outside a grocery store because there is a lineup to enter. So maybe you're standing over there. Maybe you have to stand as part of your work. Your work requires that you stand and work. The nature of your work is like that. Or maybe you're standing in the kitchen. Right. Maybe you're standing in a lineup somewhere, but as you are standing anywhere, this is a time for you to make dhikr of Allah. And then waqurudan, also while sitting. You know, sometimes the nature of our work is that we're sitting at a desk, we're sitting in the classroom, we're sitting at home because of our health. So qurudan, we're sitting in the car. وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ And also while laying down on their sides. Because sometimes while we're fasting, you know, we feel tired, so we just lay down on the couch or even on the bed. But because our, you know, sleep schedule has been changed, our eating schedule has changed, we find it difficult to fall asleep. So don't just, you know, toss and turn in bed. That is an excellent time to remember Allah. You could perhaps listen to something good at that time and increase in your knowledge so they remember Allah in all of these conditions وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And they reflect over the creation of the skies and the earth. They think. So keep your tongue busy with the dhikr of Allah. And make sure that you are more conscious, you are more aware. And one of the things that really helps us with that is if we keep learning, we keep increasing in our knowledge. So make this Ramadan a time of growth, insha'Allah. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ You should remember Allah a lot in order that you may be successful. And again, no matter what your circumstances are, you know, whatever it is that you are doing, make sure that you keep your tongue busy with the dhikr of Allah. Even if you're not able to fast, and even if you are fasting, you know, maybe when you fast, 
you are completely functional. Your energy levels are perfectly, you know, normal. Or maybe when you fast, you have very little energy. The dhikr of Allah, the remembrance of Allah is such that you can do it in any state because you don't have to make it audible. You can, but you don't always have to. You don't have to move your tongue much, right? Because the words of dhikr, many of them are very light on the tongue. So keep busy in the dhikr of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah bi dhikri lahi innul qulub. Unquestionably, with the dhikr of Allah, our hearts reassured. They find calmness and stillness in the remembrance of Allah. So even if you are feeling extremely anxious about your exams, about all the assignments that you have to submit, right? At that time also you can make dhikr. So keep your tongue busy with the remembrance of Allah. We learn the Prophet ﷺ said, وَالْحَمْدُ تَمْلَأُ الْمِيزَانِ To say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. This is something that fills the scale, the scale of deeds on the Day of Judgment. And subhanallah al-azimi wa bihamdi, you say this once and a tree is planted for you in Jannah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah is a treasure from the treasures of paradise. So whatever dhikr that we can say, in another hadith we learned that the best form of dhikr is to say la ilaha illallah. So these are simple adhkar, easy adhkar that we can say throughout the day, no matter what we are doing. Another thing is, that as you are going about your day, you know, you're fasting, you perhaps had a long morning, a long day, you know, you went to work, you went to school, you had a lot of studying to do, you had a lot of chores to do at home, maybe you had a lot of errands to run while you were fasting, then make sure that you take a nap. Make sure that you take a nap, and a nap does not mean that you're sleeping for two hours, or for three hours, or for even an hour. If your circumstances allow you to sleep for an hour during the day, excellent. But if that's not your situation, then taking a short nap of even 20 to 30 minutes, even 15 minutes is actually very helpful. And this is something that mothers especially need to do because you don't ever get a break. If you get a break physically from doing certain things, you don't get a mental break. Because as a mother, you're programmed to always think about, you know, your children, their well-being, your spouse, your family, their food, their uniform, their homework, etc. So, you know, when you're constantly working, when your mind, when your brain is constantly working, you need to allow yourself to rest. So even if you can take a short nap in the afternoon or sometime in the evening, make sure that you do that. But especially qaylula, meaning the afternoon nap, that is extremely beneficial. In a hadith, we learned that you should take qaylula because the shayateen, the devils, they don't take qaylula. They don't take a nap. So the thing is that when you take a nap, you kind of get re-energized for the rest of the day. And the month of Ramadan is such that you want to take advantage of the day and also the night. You have to worship in the night as well. So for that, you need to be well rested. If your body has been neglected, it is getting tired, you will not have the strength to stand in prayer. You will not have the energy to recite Quran. And if you're tired, you're exhausted, you're going to be very irritable, you're going to, you know, get into arguments, and you're going to be snappy. So that might be detrimental to your fast itself. So make sure that you take a nap and don't feel guilty about it. And even, you know, your children, you can tell them that I'm going to take a nap now for 20 minutes. When you hear the alarm, that's when I'm going to wake up. Communicate with your family. You know, sometimes when men come home from work, it's good for them that they should take a nap at that time. But the thing is that sometimes, you know, men, they prioritize their rest and they don't take care of the family. So make sure that you communicate with your family and you decide when the wife is going to take a nap and when the husband is going to take a nap so that both get to take a nap, even if it's going to be, you know, in turns so that the children are not neglected, work is not neglected, you know, food is also ready on time and everyone is fresh and active for the night worship. You see, we have to help each other worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better in the month of Ramadan. You know, it would be really unfair that a person is expected to take care of the children, take care of the house, 
and also, you know, do all this physical labor of preparing food, you know, early in the morning, before even morning at suhoor time, and then late in the evening. And then, you know, they're also expected to do everything. It's unfair. Women also deserve to take a nap. They deserve to get some rest. So make sure that you communicate with your family. You decide when is the best time, for example, for the husband to take a nap and when is the best time for the wife to take a nap. But this is important. Everyone deserves to get some rest so that they're able to do well in the month of Ramadan. Another thing is that throughout the day, you know, as you're fasting and as you are doing your work or your school, your current situation, whatever that demands from you, basically, make sure that you're praying properly and you're praying on time. Because in the salat, كانت على المؤمنين كتاب موقوتا. If you cannot do much, make sure that you're praying on time to the best of your ability, because this is one of the best good deeds. The Prophet ﷺ was asked that which actions are the best. And he said, As-salatu li awwali waqtiha. Prayer, not just at its proper time, but at the beginning of its time. Meaning as soon as the time for prayer enters, then you pray at that time. So yes, any time that you pray within the window, that is fine. But when you pray right away, then this is even better. So make your salah a priority. Sometimes what happens is that at the time of iftar, everybody is eager to eat. So, you know, in that, we delay the Maghrib prayer. Yes, you know, if you pray after 15 minutes, your salah is still valid. But if you pray right away, then that is even better. So remember that this is a time when we advance in doing good things, when we excel in doing good things. And it's not just the big, big things that make a difference. It's the little things also that make a difference. So yes, you can pray 15 minutes later, but you can also pray now. And if you pray now, you know, it's just a difference of 15 minutes, but there is a huge difference in terms of reward. You never know, this might be the reason for your Ramadan being better than any other Ramadan. And along with that, when it comes to Salah, make sure that you perform your Sunnah prayers throughout the day. Many times what happens is that we know we should pray Sunnah, but then you know, we get lazy or we say, it's okay, it's not fard. And we keep leaving the sunnah prayers. So make use of Ramadan and use this as an opportunity to develop the habit of praying your sunnah prayers. And these are two raka'at before fajr and six raka'at with zuhr. So four before the fard and two after, two raka'at after maghrib and two raka'at after isha. So not many raka'at if you think about it. You know, the only one that really many people find difficult is the sunnah of dhuhr prayers, because there are six rakat. But it's possible to do it. And remind yourself that, you know, it's Ramadan, I need to be better. I need to do more. Because there's a huge difference between people who perform sunnah prayers and people who don't perform sunnah prayers. Remember that for every sajda that we perform, every prostration, every sajda, there is reward. You are forgiven for your sins. You are increased in your ranks. There is a huge difference between those who perform sajda and those who don't. And every sajda counts. So people who perform sunnah prayers and those who don't, the difference between them in one year is the difference of 4,320 rakaat. Just imagine, 4,320 rakaat. This is the number of sunnah prayers that you can perform in a year. So performing 4,000 rakaat in one day, in a month, it seems to be impossible. But it's about these habits, right? If you develop this habit and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua that, Ya Allah, help me. I want to do this. And keep trying. Don't give up on yourself. Maybe you used to perform sunnah prayers regularly and then you stopped. And then you started again and then you stopped. And then you started again and you stopped. Well, start again. It's okay. Start again. Because we have to keep trying. We have to keep striving. So these 12 rak'at, make sure that you try to get them in every single day of the month of Ramadan. And you never know because of that, you might actually develop the habit of performing these every single day with the permission of Allah. Now, another thing is that throughout the day, you know, while you're fasting, make sure that you make good use of your time. The days of Ramadan are not, you know, days that we just have to survive. 
the goal should not just be, I need to somehow survive until I can break my fast. So I'm going to do nothing. I'm just going to lay down. I'm going to be on my phone, you know, watch one video, read something random, watch another funny video, and then maybe watch another TV series, watch another documentary, or, you know, just listen to something random. Your goal is not to somehow survive until you can eat again. No. Every single moment while you're fasting is a precious moment. In fact, every single moment of your life is a precious moment. The Prophet ﷺ said that there are two blessings, which a lot of people, you know, neglect. They don't value them enough. مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ And these two blessings are الصِّحَّةَ وَالْفَرَاغِ Health, good health, and free time. So yes, you need a break to feel more energized. So for example, you play a game with your sibling, your spouse, you know, something like that. You do that. It's fine. But then check yourself that how much time is going into, you know, playing games on my phone. If you're spending, you know, an hour every single day, that's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. If you're spending Three hours on social media every single day, that is, again, a lot of time. And the thing is that when we spend so much time on these things, of course, we're not going to have enough time to do other things. If you're spending too much time playing and too much time browsing on social media, going from room to room on Clubhouse, listening to random conversations, right, sometimes so meaningless, If you're spending too much time on these things, that shows that you don't have much to do. So you need to, you know, get yourself busy in doing meaningful things. And when you do more meaningful things, you will not have time to waste on these things. In a hadith, we learned the Prophet ﷺ, he asked in the morning one day that who is fasting? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, I am. The Prophet ﷺ said, which of you went to visit a sick person? And Abu Bakr ﷺ said, I did. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked that which of you attended a funeral today? And Abu Bakr again said, I did. The Prophet ﷺ asked, which of you fed a person in need today? Abu Bakr said, I did. Subhanallah, any, any good deed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked about, which of you did it? Abu Bakr said, I did. I did. Already. Subhanallah, any, these are things that we can do when we make them a priority. So yes, you know, it's possible that where you're living, maybe you're not allowed to visit people, but you can, you know, randomly send a food order to their house so that they can enjoy a nice iftar meal. You can drop something at their door. You can just, you know, drop by and say salam from outside because when you just come and see someone randomly even and you greet them and they feel so happy because of the attention that you gave them, because you came and showed them your face, that will make them happy. And bringing delight to another person, this is something that is extremely rewardable. So make use of your time. Don't just wait for each day of Ramadan to end so that you can eat again. And don't wait for the month of Ramadan to be over so that you can do other things again. No, you can do these good things even in Ramadan. And this is in fact the best time to do these things, inshallah. Another important thing is that every single day of Ramadan, make sure that you do some form of ihsan, you know, to your family, your loved ones, your close relatives, your good friends, your parents, Because this is something that we have been encouraged to do in the Qur'an over and over again, that we should do ihsan, we should do good to our relatives, especially parents, and then those who are related to us, those who are in need, those who are traveling. So every day, see how you can bring benefit to these people. Especially your parents, do good to them, make dua for them, give sadaqah on their behalf. Your relatives connect with them, you know, send a gift for them in the month of Ramadan. It could be in the form of money or in the form of other things, in the form of flowers, something, you know, to bring them joy, connect with them in whatever way that is possible. Another thing is that avoid talking excessively. 
Because talking too much, this is something that is really destructive for the heart. Yes, we need to connect with people. We need to, you know, chat and converse, etc. It's necessary, but a lot of our time should not be going into this. And especially when we're talking about he said this and she said this and he did that and she did that. This is a waste of time and this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like for us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that min husn al-islam al-mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'nihi. Of the beauty of a person's Islam is that he leaves what does not concern him. So in this Ramadan, be more careful about what you are spending your time in, what you're looking at, what you're talking about, what content you are engaging with, because that will definitely have an impact on your well-being. Another thing is that make sure that you pay attention to your family in the sense that you encourage them to do good as well. While you are, you know, paying attention to the recitation of the Quran and you are paying attention to you know, remembering Allah, giving charity, etc. Make sure that you include your family as well. Remind them, encourage them. So for example, if you have little children, tell them that, you know, for 15 minutes, we're all going to sit down and we're going to make dhikr. You know, maybe do some crafts with them where, you know, you have certain adhkar written and then each child can hold one. When they're done reading that dhikr, they can exchange you know, do some kind of activity with children even. Keep that spirit of Ramadan alive in your heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا O oh, you who have believed, save yourselves and your families from the fire. Don't just think about saving yourself. Save your families as well. You have to encourage them as well. So in whatever way that you can. Another thing is that every day give some form of charity. Charity does not just mean that you have to give money. Charity can also mean that you, you know, like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu that when you prepare soup, then increase the volume by adding more water. Why? Because then you can share some with your neighbor. Now, it's possible that given the current condition because of COVID, you may feel that like your neighbors may not be happy receiving prepared food from your kitchen. They might feel uncomfortable. Well, you can also share some of your groceries with them. So for example, if you get a whole lot of mangoes, you know, for your fruit salad, uh, maybe you can, you know, send a fruit basket for them. Because fruit, you know, everyone has to wash and peel and cut and then eat. So inshallah, that's safe. You can do these kind of things. You can get packaged dates and you can share that. And again, it doesn't have to be too lavish. It can be from your groceries as well. Because remember, food for one is enough for two. It is enough for two. So you got a whole tray of mangoes, for example. You can share half of it with your neighbors. You can share a quarter of it. Even if you, you know, put three on a plate and you put some grapes or even some apples, some dates, you know, something, but share some with your neighbors, even if they're not Muslim. You know, for many converts, their families, this is a good time to talk to your family about Ramadan. And this can be done by using food as an opportunity to share especially dates. So give some form of charity. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with wealth, then it's extremely important that you give sadaqah, meaning from your money. In a hadith we learn, and this is a very serious hadith, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he said that I reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa once while he was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba. So he was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was saying they are the losers. Humul Aksarun Warabbil Karba. They are the greatest losers by the Lord of the Karba. Humul Aksarun Warabbil Karba. They are the greatest losers by the Lord of the Karba. And by Allah, such people are the greatest losers. And the Prophet ﷺ said that multiple times. So Abu Dhar thought that he was saying this about him, and Abu Dhar was really worried that. What's wrong with me? Did I do something wrong? I must be a really bad person that the Prophet ﷺ is saying this to me. And then Abu Dhar was like, I couldn't stay quiet. So I just asked the Prophet ﷺ that who are the greatest losers? And the Prophet ﷺ said that they are the aktharun, aktharuna amwala. They are the people who have more money. 
a lot of wealth. They are the wealthy people. They are the greatest losers. Subhanallah, we think that, you know, if someone has more money, they are more fortunate. They're more successful. But the Prophet wasallam said that the people who have more wealth are more in loss. Except for the one who does like this and like this and like this. And the Prophet wasallam pointed towards his front, his right, his left. In another hadith we learned, he pointed towards all four directions. And what he implied by that is except for the one who keeps spending on others. And he constantly giving. And the thing is that spending, giving does not reduce your wealth. Right? That's what the Prophet ﷺ told us. So make it a habit that in the month of Ramadan, you are actually giving charity every single day. And, you know, given, depending on your budget, this can be even the amount of $5 a day, $10 a day, or it can be more depending on, you know, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has enabled you. Some people think that in Ramadan, we only give zakat. Zakat, you're supposed to give when it's due. Meaning if you've had a certain amount of money of a certain kind sitting with you for an entire lunar year, you're supposed to give zakat on it. You don't have to wait for Ramadan to give zakat unless your zakat is due in Ramadan. But along with zakat, besides zakat, we should also give sadaqah, right? We should also give charity. And charity can be in the form of money. And money doesn't just mean that you're spending on, you know, people in need. Absolutely, that is a form of sadaqah, a very important form of sadaqah. But charity also includes spending in the way of Allah, giving a donation to your local mosque, giving a donation to an Islamic institute, an educational institute, spending on a student of knowledge, spending money on publications, right, of Islamic materials, giving money to, you know, for example, someone who is striving to not take an interest-based loan while they're studying. So you sponsor a student. Allah has blessed you with with money. You have spare money sitting with you and you find out about, you know, a young person who is in school and they have to pay for their education and they're working. So if you have money to spare, why not bring relief to them? And when you bring relief to someone, then remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring relief to you on the day of judgment. He will ease your difficulties on the day of judgment. So there isn't just one kind of charity. There's different kinds of charities. And make sure that you contribute in different avenues, in different ways. You can sponsor an orphan. You can make sure that people get milk to drink, you know, good food to eat. You can spend money on their education, on surgeries, on people getting eyeglasses. There's so many ways, mashallah. So make sure that you contribute in whatever that you can. The more, the better, inshallah. Another important thing is that every day of Ramadan, practice forgiveness, which means that you show forgiveness to other people. Because we want forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He urges people that they should forgive others and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Do you not love that Allah should forgive you? So in other words, if you want Allah to forgive you, then you show forgiveness to other people as well. And begin by showing forgiveness to your family. You know, the people who are closest to you hurt you the most. Because of course, you are interacting with them more, right? You are engaging with them more. And because of that, the chances of you getting hurt at their hands are more. I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about, you know, things that cause annoyance. Like, for example, your teenager shows you attitude. Your spouse says something that is, you know, extremely demeaning and you feel very disrespected. You feel like they're not acknowledging your struggle or that they neglect your needs because they say that they're fasting. Right. And things like that. So show forgiveness, practice forgiveness. Why? Because when you show forgiveness, then this is something that will de-escalate the situation. The situation will not get worse. You will not end up in an argument, in a quarrel. And at the same time, inshallah, when you show forgiveness, you will also earn forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then when it comes to iftar, when it comes to breaking the fast, at that time, yes, you are preparing, you know, all these good foods, alhamdulillah. But at the same time, make sure that you make dua as well. 
Because the Prophet ﷺ said that there are three people whose supplication is not rejected. The fasting person, when he breaks his fast, is one of these three people. So at the time when you break your fast, make sure that you spend a few minutes making dua. Don't just get busy in munching and in chewing good foods and enjoying all those delicious flavors. Before that, make dua for yourself and make dua for your family, your loved ones, for people in general. Another thing is that don't overdo it when you're breaking your fast. Because if you overeat at the time, and if you eat irresponsibly, then that is going to affect your energy levels. And that is going to inhibit you from praying in the night. And the nights of Ramadan are extremely precious. So yes, eat, but eat consciously. Make sure that you are eating foods that are hydrating, that are, you know, whole foods that don't have much oil in them. Make sure that you eat what is suitable for your body, that brings you energy, that sits well with your stomach, that doesn't cause you health issues. Of course, your cravings, they do reach a really high level when you're fasting, but take care of your body, feed it well. And even that is ibadah, even that is rewardable. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that al-mu'min al-qawiyyu khayrun wa ahabu ila Allah min al-mu'min al-dhaif. That the believer who is strong is better and more beloved to Allah than the believer who is weak. And a lot of times, our strength and weakness, you know, yes, it is related to our, you know, physical capacity, our overall health. But you know, a lot of times, it is affected by what we eat and when we sleep and how we work. And overall, what our lifestyle is. If we live a sedentary lifestyle where we're not walking much, we're not moving about much, we're not hydrating our bodies, we're not eating responsibly, then of course you will have weakness. You will not have the strength to recite Quran. You will not have the strength to, you know, stand in prayer. So make sure that you eat more consciously. And also, you know, make sure that you go for a walk or you are doing some type of workout, something to freshen up your body, to boost those energy levels so that you don't, you know, become lazy and tired right after you break your fast. Another important thing is that night worship in the month of Ramadan, incredibly important, as I mentioned it at the beginning, that this is a means of forgiveness for our sinful deeds. So make sure that you pray in the night, every single night. It could be eight rakat, six rakat, two rakat, whatever it is, do something. And especially seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night. When you wake up for the hajjud prayer or you stay up late in your qiyam, you know, in the middle of your worship, make sure that you seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is also a time to make du'as in the night especially. And make sure that you also get some sleep in the night. Because this was the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he would sleep in the night, even in the month of Ramadan. That doesn't mean that you sleep all night long and you don't pray any qiyam, you don't even wake up for suhoor. No, even if you can get in a few hours, make sure that you give your body the chance to rest in the night. Because that is far more beneficial for the body than sleeping during the daylight hours. Finally, one last thing I want to mention is that when it comes to suhoor, make sure that you eat well. Attend to your body, because if you don't hydrate your body, if you don't eat well, it's going to affect your energy levels. If you don't have good energy levels, it's going to affect your mood. It's going to affect your work. It's going to affect your relationships. It's going to affect your ibadah. So how is it that you're going to eat at suhoor? Pay attention to that. An easy thing is, you know, for example, if you make overnight oats, this is something that has helped me for the past few years, you know, just put the oats in milk, whatever milk that you drink. And, um, you know, you just leave it outside even. You don't have to necessarily refrigerate it, especially if it's just going to be sitting for a few hours. But, you know, fill it with good nuts and seeds and fruit. It will hydrate your body and, you know, it will give you that sense of fullness. And if you eat something heavy, oily, that's going to make you really sleepy and tired, it's going to drain you of your energy levels. So eat well. And in hadith, we learn about how dates are the best suhoor. So you could also eat that in your overnight oats or whatever it is that you eat, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to worship Him in the best way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our sins through the month of Ramadan. May this Ramadan be a source of purification for us and increase in good habits 
for us and something that will be a means of success for us in this life and in the next. Inshallah, we will conclude over here. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.